try again. Oh. There we go. Okay, so I have to make sure that we're actually live here, Mark. So give me a minute because one screen's telling me we're not live and this is telling me we're live. And we are live. So sorry guys, we had a little glitch on the start there. So welcome to the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association's Facebook page. Today I am joined by Dr. Mark Sherrod of NYU and their HCM program to discuss with you a unique phase one clinical trial brought to us by Celtrion. Um, and I'm going to have Dr. Sherrod um, talk to you today about this clinical trial and how you can participate. We are only looking for a few specific individuals. This is a clinical trial for those with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague of 25 plus years, Dr. Mark Sherrod. Good evening, Mark. Good evening. Thanks for having this, Lisa. I really appreciate it. And um, I, um, I'm pretty excited about this, this particular study because I've known about this drug for years and uh, the possibility of it uh, being available in the United States fills me with a fair amount of uh, optimism and hope. Um, so uh, I guess what I'll do is um, I'll share the screen here and uh, hopefully you'll be able to You'll be able to see um, my screen. Uh, does that work okay? That would be perfect. Um, so we're not on screen share yet. Don't see it yet. Uh -huh. We're not on. Uh, there we go. So you may have. Yeah, there you go. How's perfect. It? Great. Okay. So um, my name is Dr. Mark Sherrod from NYU, um, I, and I'm I'm talking with you about S-cybenzoline and um, this particular medication is um, being studied for introduction in the United States and around the world for obstructive HCM. Um, and um, these are my disclosures. So I've served as a consultant for these companies. And uh, in putting together this protocol, I received uh, some fees from Celtrion. Uh, it's not a approved by the US FDA. Uh, and um, it's in clinical trial, hoping that someday it might be. So cybenzoline is, is a medicine which has been prescribed for obstructive HCM and non-obstructive HCM in Japan for 25 years. So this is a medicine with a significant track record. Um, it is a medicine that comes um, uh, and marketed here uh, as a mixture of two medications, uh, two um, isomers, and uh, it works similar to disapyramide in that it's a sodium channel and calcium channel blocker with little anticholinergic activity. That means it doesn't dry your mouth out or cause constipation. Uh, the way disapyramide can infrequently um, have as a side effect. So this medicine has been marketed and used as an antiarrhythmic drug in, in Japan, France, and Belgium for 30 years. These are the HCM guidelines in Japan um, as published in, in their cardiology journal. For patients with obstructive HCM, you can see uh, along with these familiar names, uh, cybenzoline as medical therapy, often as the, the last medical therapy before consideration of, uh, of surgery or septal ablation. So there have been quite a, a lot of publications um, of this uh, medication that have been published over the years, showing a decrease in LV outflow tract gradients here dramatically shown in this uh, 2005 publication. Uh, the principal author here is Dr. Hamada. And because I actually read these um, publications, I went over to Japan and gave several lectures um, in, 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 in other places, but then finally uh, met up with uh, uh, Dr. Hamada and uh, 
talked to his colleagues uh, about our experience in the United States and had had a chance to talk about his experience with cybenzaline. I first learned about the drug in this publication in 1997. Uh, and this got um, a lot of attention and I really was hoping that one day we could see it here in the United States. Um, but that was not to be because um, to have a drug come to the United States, it would have to be picked up by a drug company and introduced here. So what did happen uh, was at one of our summits about four years ago, I was approached by this company, Celtrion, which is a Korean um, pharma company. And they asked me if I was interested in organizing a study um, in three countries, um, the US, Japan, and Poland, to investigate this particular medication uh, towards the end of trying to get it approved in the United States. And we got that up and going. And in the interim, um, this um, particular study of cybenzaline was published in the European uh, Society of Cardiology Heart Failure Journal. And I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this uh, before I talk with you about our study. So this was a, an observational study, which means it's not randomized and not blinded of 88 patients with obstructive HCM, middle age, treated with cybenzaline for 16 years. So this is a long time on drug compared to 41 patients who did not receive cybenzaline, but largely received beta blocker and calcium channel blockers. Again, long follow-up. This length of study is, is much longer than most Western studies uh, that are you know, on the average five or six years. No patient dropped out of the cybenzaline group, um, showing that there were really very low side effects and no organ toxicity was noted. So that means that, you know, it didn't cause hepatic or renal dysfunction, didn't cause neuropathy or severe unrelenting rash or any other problems um, of, the, of the organs. Um, so this makes it useful as a long-term drug. It also had low anticholinergic activity, um, so it doesn't dry your mouth or cause constipation. Interestingly, in this study, um, I learned that um, in Japan, um, ICDs are only infrequently implanted. Uh, only five patients in this whole study of, of 129 patients received ICDs. And you'll see that the incidence of sudden death uh, with cybenzaline was very low. So here's what happens in this representative slide of a gradient, a Doppler gradient, which you're probably familiar with in this patient of 184 millimeters of mercury dropping down to a gradient uh, on long-term treatment of about 26, 25 millimeters of mercury. Um, so overall with subbenzaline gradients decrease from an average of 110 millimeters to 20 millimeters of mercury. So uh, a good reduction in gradient and an improvement in diastolic function shown here on Doppler. And here are two EKGs before and after, and this is a decrease in the amount of left ventricular hypertrophy from here to the follow-up EKG showing a decrease in voltage which is the EKG uh, correlate of, of left ventricular hypertrophy. So cybenzaline, um, the combination medicine reduces obstructive HCM complications. Um, that is in the patients here treated in, in without cybenzaline with beta blocker, calcium channel blocker. Many of these patients developed heart failure as opposed to vanishingly few with subbenzaline. Atrial fibrillation was uncommon and syncope was uncommon in the subbenzaline treated group. So this is pretty encouraging that very few patients had HCM related complications. And in this observational study, subbenzaline decreased the incidence of death 
here in cybenzaline compared to patients treated with beta blocker calcium channel blocker. Um, after um, 15 years, many of the patients had died. Remember, these were middle-aged patients who were enrolled and a 15 to 16 year old you know, study. So it's, it's not surprising that there were deaths. Um, and here, uh, what they died of, and you can see they predominantly died of, of heart failure um, in the beta blocker of verapamil group. So cybenzaline may delay deterioration and heart failure in HCM and thus be a, a promising drug um, for the treatment long-term of obstructive HCM. Looked at another way uh, with this so-called Kaplan-Meier curve here, follow-up period on this axis, percentage of patients who survive, more patients survived on cybenzaline uh, than off it. So cybenzaline may be a multiplayer drug in obstructive HCM treatment. It attenuates and reduces LV alpha tract gradient. It's been safely used in Japan for 30 years and has a well-known safety profile and little anticholinergic effect. Um, I'll say here that when I attended the Japanese Heart Society and I asked a variety of physicians what drug they preferred for this condition, cybenzaline was identified as their drug of choice. It improves uh, LV diastolic function, and it also has an antiarrhythmic effect and may um, decrease ventricular and atrial arrhythmias. So it may have a variety of benefits which make it uh, a good candidate to study. So what the Korean company Celtrion has done is they have uh, isolated one of the isomers, one part of the mixed drug, the S isomer. So here is why it's called S cybenzaline. And this is the agent which is being studied um, for um, um, approval uh, in, by the FDA. Uh, as this has gone on, uh, some basic research has, has, has looked at S-cybenzaline in, in vitro, that is in, in the test tube. These studies were done by Dr. Capini in Florence, Italy, uh, where at the time of myectomy, muscle cells um, were extracted uh, in the course of the myectomy, separated, and then subjected to uh, some serious science, which looked at the uh, amount of ions in the, uh, in the cells and also how hard they contract. And so the observation is that, that um, with increasing doses of, of uh, S-cybenzaline, the amount of calcium in the cell uh, rather dramatically decreases with increased concentration. And this is the way the drug works. Uh, by decreasing the amount of calcium, which is overloaded in the HCM cardiomyocyte, uh, the, the heart muscle cells contract less hard, uh, translating to a decrease in the force of contraction and therefore less SAM and less LV alpha tract obstruction. So the way a um, study like this gets, um, gets done is that first, um, um, the drug is given to, um, um, to normal volunteers um, in increasing doses and, um, and no adverse effects uh, or significant adverse effects and no QT prolongation was identified in normals. Next, um, the study that's ongoing here and, and the reason why we're having this this. Uh, Facebook Live is because we are looking for volunteers to spend five days in the hospital in a phase one study to receive in cohort three here, uh, the cybenzaline um, under observation um, and under our care um, in three sites in the United States. 
um, hoping uh, that the drug will uh, be shown to be both safe and effective. Especially we're interested in showing safety. Um, five days in the hospital is a significant chunk of time and uh, volunteers for this study will be well compensated for their time. Um, we will be watching uh, the EKG throughout to assure safety. And um, we're um, hoping to recruit uh, two or three volunteers um, who can um, participate in the study. Um, there will be a questionnaire uh, at the end of this Facebook Live uh, that will be distributed um, by the HCMA. And if you answer those questions and you meet the criteria, we will um, be in touch with you. So what are the criteria? Well, you've got to be between 18 and 70 years. You have to be um, uh, of, of, a, of, of this body mass index, which is uh, um, pretty liberal. Uh, you have to have HCM with obstruction with a gradient of either 30 at rest or 50 with Valsalva, and it has to be due to systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. And you have to have an ejection fraction more than 55. Exclusion criteria, the main ones here are diabetes under treatment and concurrent treatment with disapyramide or ranolazine within seven days of screening. So you can't be on these drugs uh, within seven days. So it's possible to be in the study if these uh, agents are stopped a, a week before the screening um, echocardiogram and tests. Assuming that uh, all goes the way it's gone so far, uh, we will be embarking on a phase two study uh, of symptomatic obstructive HCM. And we will um, be looking here at gradients and exercise tolerance, uh, hoping to show um, uh, improvement in, in a larger group of patients. So um, S-cybenzaline um, should be a, a drug that you should know about, and I hope you do now. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, respond. Thanks for your attention. Mark, thank you so much for that informative presentation. I do want to go over um, and have you stop sharing your screen for whatever reason it's not letting me. Um, so you can, there you go. Here we are again. Um, I want to go over a couple of items. Right now, it is a single site. We just need a handful of other patients to participate. We've already had a few enroll. So we are only recruiting for New York and the link. No, we're recruiting for LA as well. We're, we don't have the authorization to recruit for LA at this point. Okay. So HCMA is recruiting right now for New York. I see. Okay, but. I, I don't, I don't but, know if they're actually open and accepting other patients right now in, in the other site, but we can no, double check. It is IRB approved. You know. It is IRB approved there. They were a little bit slow on the, uh, and getting that all done. So hopefully they're ready now, but for right now, um, we're looking for New York. It's true. The sponsor will pay for your travel to New York. They will pay for a companion. They will pay your food and hotel, and there is a stipend for the week in the hospital. We know right. it's a big, big, big ask, and you will be compensated well is all I can really tell you right now. Um, I would say for the average person, it would more than cover their week out of work. So I encourage you, if you're not sure and you want to learn more, fill out the survey, see if you uh, meet the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, and then we can set up an opportunity for you to speak to a clinical trial coordinator to answer all of those other questions. So it's a great opportunity to make sure that you have an understanding of what's going on, what you're going to be given as a medication, 
what you'll be expected to do while in the hospital, which is not a lot. So you can bring your laptop and your TV and catch up on your binge watching. Um, so there's no exercise study on this one. It is just tolerance, correct? Right, exactly. We aim for boring. <laughs> so their testing is going to be blood draws, EKG, and is there an echo as well? Yes. And how often are the echoes done? Uh, for the first day and the fifth day, um, relatively frequently. But uh, so it's, it's, you know, there's several echoes on the first day and uh, at least two on the, on the fifth day. We will be happy to take your questions now. If you have any, you can please post them. And I'm putting a little note, any questions now? Um, I think that was quite comprehensive. It's, you know, a lot of people are focusing on drug development and HCM now, as we know. Um, I think it's interesting that in 97, we, there was an interest, but no real ability to bring a drug to market in the HCM space. There was no tolerance for that at that point. And here we are in 2022 with a lot going on in the HCM space, and it's good to have options. We know that there's been another drug recently approved, and we know that there's other trials underway, but this mechanism is a little bit different. It's got some longitudinal data that gives us some comfort. And if anybody wants to give it a try, we know that there have been um, production issues and outages with isopyramide, long acting, AKA Norpace. So this would be a nice opportunity to have something else in the, in the toolbox to pull from when we need it. So um, this is our opportunity to make sure that that happens, but we need a couple of people to step up and to take the survey and to talk to a clinical trial coordinator and get themselves engaged. Right. So, so when I, when I talk to patients these days, I say, um, you know, it's, I mean, it's too bad you're stuck here in 2022 with this disease because you didn't do anything wrong to get it. You just were born with it and it's developed over time. But on the other hand, you're lucky that you have it in 2022 because for the first time since we came out of the caves, um, there are drugs being developed specifically for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And, and so 2022 is not a bad time to have this condition because uh, we're making great strides um, and we have um, the potential for some really good medical therapy. And of course, our surgeons are getting much better at, at taking care of the condition as well. So, um, you know, there's a, a good side to this and a, and a bad side to this, but uh, we're filling. We're 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 focusing on on the cup being half full uh, on this particular evening. So the good news is we don't have a lot of questions, which means we might have must have been quite uh, detailed in our explanation. Just as a review, it is 6:30 p.m. on May 10th, 2022, as we're recording this. So if you see this after later tonight you can post a question we will respond but the link to the survey monkey survey run by the hcma is right in this link if you're not comfortable with providing the hcma with your contact information you can contact nyu directly and speak to a clinical site coordinator you can find the information uh, for their contact on our website at 4hcm.org or you can go to clinicaltrials.gov look up the trial and do a go for it the hard way and you can get there that way but it is a relatively easy study in terms of what is expected of the individual. It is a known agent in other countries. We're just trying to get it to market here so that patients have an opportunity to take advantage of another treatment option. So I see we have a couple of viewers right now, but no questions. Um, I'll give you one last, few moments to say I have a question and then you can type it slowly if you need to. Um, Dr. Sharon, is there anything else we need to know about this particular agent that is important for patients to understand? I think the, um, the attractive part about it is, first of all, that it, um, it's been around for a long time. Second of all, that it 
it doesn't seem to drop the ejection fraction inordinately, uh, which is a big advantage. Uh, so it, 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 it has not been reported to cause heart failure in any patients. Um, and it doesn't have any organ toxicity. So um, since safety is right at the very top of our list um, uh, in the drug development um, arena, uh, this, uh, this agent um, is attractive. So, and, and, and I think, you know, why would someone volunteer besides uh, for their own personal interest? Well, um, you know, we have to think of this as a, a community effort for um, the HCM population as a whole. The more drugs we have, um, the better it's gonna be for all of the patients. And uh, that's what our focus is. We need more medications for HCM. And, uh, you know, my view is that we need, we have four at the moment under investigation at our site. And uh, just, that's what we've got to, to come out, come out of this with is four new drugs. And uh, if we, if we do that, um, we will uh, have a lot happier uh, group of patients coming through our doors. We do have a question and I'm not surprised of this question. Uh, there's an awful lot of attention on obstructive HCM and medications for obstructive HCM. What about the non-obstructive community? Do right. you believe that there'll be a role for this agent? Should it get approved and not obstructed? Do we need another trial for that? What do you think? So um, you may remember that in the beginning of the talk, I showed you uh, a, a series of papers um, by Hamada et al. They showed that this drug improves the diastolic function in HCM, meaning how well the heart relaxes. And um, that is the problem in diastole. The heart is restricted in its ability to, to relax. So this drug is widely used in Japan for non-obstructive HCM. Uh, and you know this is an incremental process. And um, if the drug does well for obstructive HCM and is brought to market or even uh, enters a phase three study, I, I think we'll see a phase one study um, for diastolic uh, HCM. Um, and I'm, uh, if, if, if um, future's any guide to the past, it will work for, for non-obstructive HCM the way it has in Japan. So typically <coughs> the approval process, we have one utilization. So right now we're looking at obstructive HCM. So that has to go through the process, prove safety, get through the trial, and then we can come back and look for other utilizations once we get past that step. Right. <coughs> I think we're all aware that uh, for non-obstructive HCM, that there's a big gap um, in our treatment uh, armamentarium. And um, these you know, patients with non-obstructive HCM could be just as symptomatic or more symptomatic than the obstructed group. Um, current, um, current company included. And um, I think that we, um, we need better treatments for the non-obstructed patients. And uh, the more drugs we have, uh, the better chances are that we'll come up with highly effective drugs. Now, also uh, uh, bear in mind that this drug works differently from, uh, from, from some of the other medications. The, um, the myosin ATPase inhibitors, the, uh, those drugs work by decreasing the amount of energy that's available at the sarcomere. And by doing that, decrease the force of contraction and increase relaxation in that way. This medicine has a different mode of action. It decreases the amount of calcium in the cell, which is the trigger for both hypercontractility and also um, impaired relaxation. So by decreasing the amount of calcium in the cell, 
it decreases the force of contraction, decreases the hypercontractility, and also improves relaxation. So I think you bring up an excellent point, and I'm sure somebody who's either watching now or will be watching later is wondering to themselves, well, if I'm interested in doing a trial, which is the best one I can do, and I'm going to argue and say, right now, we need the community to step up and do all different types of trials, because we know there's not going to be one answer for HCM. Different people are going to respond differently to different medications, and there's no, no surprise in that. So to make sure that we have available, safe, tested options ensures that there's going to be a bucket for somebody to fall into at some point. So we need lots of options so that we have an opportunity to treat as many people as possible and improve their quality of life. That's my statement. <laughs> okay, I we have cleared up our questions. If anybody has any additional questions, then call the office. We're happy to uh, make sure that you get answers to that. But truly the best way to really understand if a clinical trial is right for you is to have a conversation with a clinical trial um, coordinator who can explain all of the steps of the process in a much more detailed way as they affect you. And they can talk to you about what reimbursements will be made for travel, hotel, et cetera, and what fees will be paid, which I think you'll wanna learn about. So I encourage you to fill out the survey if you are an obstructed individual who doesn't like their quality of life right now and would like to see if there's something that can be done to improve that. Um, if you've tried disapyramide in the past and it's worked for you, but you don't like the side effects, this is a great study for somebody like you um, because the mechanisms are similar as you've heard, but without the side effects. So if you like Norpay CR or you're taking Daiso and you are in the area and you want to travel into New York, uh, fill out the application, talk to a clinical site coordinator and see if you can um, enroll. And I will leave it at that. We're looking for about two or three people to be eligible to do this. So please do complete the survey and pass it along to your family members and HCM friends on social media. And hopefully we will find those few people that we need to populate this really important study. Dr. Sherrod, thank you for spending some time with us this evening. You're a wonder, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you.